Hi, my name is Cindy Parr, and I uh, have been here at the Smithsonian for the past four years working on a project called the Encyclopedia of Life. I was originally a behavioral ecologist interested in birds, but for the last 15 or 20 years I've been working on informatics research projects. Encyclopedia of Life is a website that provides global access to knowledge about life on Earth. So let me deconstruct that. Global means not just that our scope is global, we're interested in wildlife and, and plants and fungi all over the world, but our partnerships also extend across the world. We're not just a, a North American project. Um, access means everything is free and also freely reusable uh, according to Creative Commons licenses. Um, knowledge actually refers to the fact that we're not serving up raw data. What we're actually serving is information that's synthesized or summarized across organisms. And finally, life on Earth is essentially biological diversity. So we actually have pages, uh, several million pages about organisms around the world. And um, we've got four million data objects distributed across those pages so that almost a million of them have at least some text or some multimedia. Up to now, we've focused on our more general audiences, which are most of those 55,000 registered members. But my talk today will show that we are being used for science and that we have great potential to be used more for science. So this is a, a diagram of, of how EOL works. We get information from over 200 sources. Most of those are scientific databases, but um, some of them are uh, sources like Flickr and Wikipedia. This isn't working. Um, those all come on to, we sort them out onto organism, organism pages on the Encyclopedia of Life where they're subject to curation by credentialed scientists and um, they're also uh, able to get um, feedback, comments, ratings from the general public and all of that is fed back to the original sources. The information on EOL is also available to programs, so application programming interfaces, APIs, I'll talk about more in a moment. So I want to emphasize that EOL is dealing with summarized knowledge. So for example, the serpent's head cowrie that you see here, um, we have images from the Morea Biocode project, but instead of serving individual specimen data, we also get uh, an overall distribution map of those specimens from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. We can also get a summary of environmental data that's associated with those specimens from the Ocean Biogeographic Information System database. Now imagine if we could do a summary like this across all museum specimen databases in the world. That would give us a good sense of the environmental characteristics for each of those organisms. Um, and, and those summaries can actually be data used in fur further analyses. This is a, a graphical depiction of some of that data. So uh, Jen Hammock on my staff has worked with uh, programmers at the Marine Biological Laboratory and converted those numbers into uh, basically environmental envelopes. So you can see that this small slice um, there in blue is showing where this cowrie lives in terms of salinity with respect to the global ocean maximums and minimums that are out there. Now, we actually, if you look at fif just 15 of our content providers and look at the kinds of numeric data that they have available, we actually have information like this or, for example, body size or longevity data for over 800,000 species. And that's not currently available directly at EOL, but it's accessible through EOL. Now, we also collaborate with the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which is in the process of scanning tens of millions of pages of out of copyright, primarily uh, legacy literature about biodiversity, and it's linking it to EOL pages. And uh, Martin Kalfatovic and his team have done a recent look to see how much that's getting used, and it looks like just in the last five months, 10% of the monographs that were tagged with digital object identifiers have been used, probably for scholarly citations. So that's getting used. Just imagine if we could go into those um, documents and pull out the data and use that data for science. We have a feature on EOL where you can build collections. So imagine you're a scientist interested in the evolution of red coloration in plants. There's actually a talk next week at University of Maryland just on this subject. Um, you can search on EOL for organisms with a characteristic like that and add each one to a collection. We've actually done this already for blue coloration. This is the Life is Blue collection. Then if you're a programmer, you can write a program that uses our API to retrieve database identifiers for each of those organisms and use those identifiers to then pull data such as genetic sequences or other environmental data from other external databases and then clean it up a little bit, do some analysis and repeat the process. Um, 
We're hoping to make those steps two and three a lot easier in the future so that all you would need to do is push a button and say, download data for all of these organisms. Finally, we've got a, a great uh, thing going on now for crowdsourcing. So one of our uh, team members, Jen Hammock again, has built a collection uh, for photographs that have evidence of associations, predation, um, parasitism, that sort of thing. And she's asking crowds of people to help identify the partners in those photographs. That then gets cataloged in this known associates collection, and that data is available for uh, ecologists to download and use for modeling, like you see there on the right. So we can do more. Um, this weekend, I actually have a deadline. I'm asking uh, the community to come up with phylogenetic trees that we can use to organize our data based on evolutionary relationships, and that will go a long way towards helping biologists take our data and put it into an evolutionary context. Um, in May, I've got a deadline to uh, have ideas for using EOL for computable data, and once we've selected one, we'll provide funding to actually uh, use those ideas to generate some scientific results. And then finally, we've got a workshop in September where we're bringing computer scientists together with biologists to, again, explore ways that EOL can improve. And ultimately, all of this leads to what I have envisioned as the phenotype repository that the Smithsonian could lead, which is basically a gateway for the world scientists to get access to good descriptions of all the organisms of the world for their large-scale data-intensive studies. So summing up, we already offer powerful aggregation, summarizing, searching, curating, and crowdsourcing features. The content's already usable for research, and we're in the process of enhancing the platform so that we can be better used for research in the future. And so the question that I want to leave you with is, what questions do you want to answer, and what data or features do you need in order to be able to do that? Thanks. I, I have been using EOL. Great. I find it wonderfully useful. Um, but I would like some more pictures. Ah. And uh, if so. Let me, let me speak a little bit to that. So her question, her question is that she's finding EOL very useful, which is great to hear, but she would like to see more pictures. And that's actually a big strength we have, but it's also a challenge. Turns out that pictures are one of those kinds of intellectual property that some people are reluctant to share as freely as we are asking them to share it. And so we're in the process of changing the culture of intellectual property in the sciences so that people are no longer afraid to share those kinds of media. Um, so that it can be reused by other people. And it's getting easier. Over the five years that the project's been around, I think we're finding that more and more people are willing to expose this information, not just pictures, but data, too, because they see that bad things don't happen. Actually, good things happen. People end up reusing, and, and their work has much more impact if they make it as freely available as possible. Okay. Yeah. Can you speak briefly to the quality control? Sure. So we actually have about a thousand credentialed scientists who have volunteered to help with quality control, which is a lot, except that if you think about two million species on Earth, that's still a lot of territory to cover. And we basically have ways that each of those curators can trust or untrust the information that's coming in. Everything coming in from sources like Wikipedia or Flickr is clearly marked unreviewed. So we're making it very obvious that it has not yet been reviewed by a credentialed scientist. Um, and slowly but surely, we're working through it. We're also finding a lot of errors in scientific databases that have been out there for decades, and only until it was exposed on EOL um, is it now obvious that there's problems, and we're hoping, we're working with the original sources to get those problems fixed. <laughs>